Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is our second LSC Sci Fair Library Suffrage Centennial Book Club. And my name is Regina and I'm a librarian at Lone Star College Sci Fair Branch Library. And before we proceed with the presentation, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. And you can also see them on your screen. Uh, first, this event is being recorded and will be available on our book club libguide as well as the chat transcript. So please keep your mic or your computer muted when you are not talking so we can hear everyone clearly and eliminate any background noise. Just a note on that, I will have everyone hard muted until the Q&A portion of our presentation. Second, if you are experiencing any technical difficulties or if you're kicked out of the meeting, you can rejoin the meeting by clicking on the WebEx meeting link and just logging in again. Um, please, a reminder to follow us on social media at LSC sci -Fair Library and visit cyflib.info backslash suffrage BC for more info on our upcoming suffrage centennial programs and book clubs. Finally, if you enjoyed this presentation, please take a few minutes to complete the post program survey. Uh, at the end of this presentation, it'll pop up and then take a moment to leave us a comment on the Facebook event page. And then um, also you can email library at lonestar.edu if you have any feedback and you can click on the Google form survey on the Suffrage Centennial LibGuide Book Club uh, page as well to, to leave some feedback. Okay, so this past Tuesday, we celebrated the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution, which granted white women the right to vote. Uh, today, I'm excited to welcome journalist and author of Mr. President, How Long Must We Wait? Alice Paul Woodrow Wilson and the Fight for the Right to Vote by Tina Cassidy. So now I'm gonna go ahead and switch the presentation over to Tina and unmute her. Thank you all so much. It's a pleasure to be speaking with all of you today. Um, I have a show that will go about 20 minutes um, that is interspersed with a few readings from my book. And um, I just wanted to, to comment on uh, one aspect of the introduction, which is that the 19th Amendment gave women the vote. Um, that has certainly become shorthand for um, sort of a, a, a century's worth of looking back on what the 19th Amendment achieved. Um, but technically, the 19th Amendment gave American citizens who were women the right to vote. Um, the issue is that at that time, uh, in 1920, there were uh, Native Americans who weren't considered citizens. Uh, Asian Americans weren't allowed to be citizens. And although black women were included in winning voting rights with the 19th Amendment, there were many states and local um, uh, governments that immediately disenfranchised black voters by imposing things like poll taxes and literacy tests. So I just wanted to clarify um, that point. So. Well, you, I'll, you know, as I work through this presentation, hopefully all of those details will sort of come to life for you. Um, really about the suffrage movement and its parallels to today. And while my book is a, a historical narrative of how Alice Paul fought President Wilson and won voting rights for women, the parallels between the century old story and what's happening today are what compel me the most, reflecting contemporary issues about patriotism, racism, what's the right way to protest, how slow the pace of change can be, whether a movement can be divided and still be successful, and how to right the wrongs of inequality. First, a little background on this story. I owe this book to a trending hashtag on Twitter for Women's Equality Day, um, which I saw for the first time in August of 2016, so four years ago this month. I clicked on that hashtag to learn more and realized that it marks the day in 1920 when the amendment was ratified. And despite how momentous it was to enfranchise half the population, the story of how it happened was never part of my history lessons growing up. So I've made it my mission not just to write a book about it, but to um, share the story with as many people as possible. So on the next slide, uh, we can talk about who Alice Paul was and what we can learn from her today. 
She was a Quaker from New Jersey whose parents instilled in her the belief that everyone is equal. She was educated at a time when not many girls were, and she wanted to fight for social justice. So she went to England to study at a Quaker Institute there, and that is where she saw the Pankhursts. On the next slide, you'll see that the Pankhursts were a family of women. Uh, the mother, a widow named Emmeline, whom you see here, and her two daughters, Sylvia and Christabel. And they were the leaders of the more militant suffragette movement. And I'll pause on that term because suffragette was a term imposed on these women by those who wanted to be derogatory about it. Um, it was meant to be diminutive and, and negative. And so these women adopted that term as their own. Um, I chose not to use that term unless it was part of a quote or a letter or something like that in my book, because again, it, it was meant to be derogatory. So the main term that we use is suffragist. So the Pankhursts were part of this suffragette movement. And they had the audacity to speak on street corners on soapboxes. They organized marches and rallies for votes. And Alice Paul was captivated not just by what the Pankhursts were doing, but by how they were treated in response, uh, specifically locked up in prison. So she decided to put her life on hold and join them. And in those couple of years in England, she learned everything she needed to know, mostly outside of the classroom, to advance the women's movement in America. She sailed back home to get a master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania and decided to join the American suffrage cause, which was stuck in a rut. On the next slide, um, you can see uh, what the landscape looked like in 1913. So at this point in time, Alice Paul wasn't yet a lawyer. She would receive her first of three law degrees in 1922. But at this time, she was still a student and an activist, but she knew that laws were skewed against women. And her master's thesis from Penn was called Toward equality and it carefully picked apart all the ways that laws are stacked against women. Imagine that women weren't allowed to get a divorce without losing their kids or their home. They were unable to have their own bank account even up until the 1970s without a man signing for it. These were just some of the ways that the laws were stacked against women. And she also knew that every state had its own rules that kept women as subordinate lesser citizens. So the old school suffragists did not believe the federal government would ever grant the franchise. And so they politely asked for voting rights at the state level. But as you can see here on this slide, since the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, they had made very little progress. And by 1913, for example, women only had full voting rights in six states all out west. And you can see them here in white. They were Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Idaho, Washington, and California. The black states were states that had, were not giving suffrage to women. And this is why Alice Paul believed it was time for an entirely new approach, a new strategy, a federal amendment. So she joined this main suffrage group called the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or the National American for short, and she tried to agitate within that existing framework for a new approach. They were really unsure that uh, they should put her stock in, in Alice Paul's approach, but they humored her at first um, when she asked them if she could organize a suffrage procession. They initially, uh, but reluctantly, agreed. So on the next slide, you will see how on March 3rd, 1913, one day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration, Alice Paul made history. On the left, you have Inez Milholland, whom Alice Paul chose to lead the parade on her white horse, because frankly, she was not just a brilliant lawyer and an active suffrage, suffragist, but she was also young and beautiful, which was the opposite of the stereotypical suffragist at that time. Alice Paul was nothing if not sharp when it came to public relations, but her strategy was not seamless. And while the parade was successful in generating attention for the cause, it did reveal some deep divisions. And this is one of the first parallels between then and now that I would like to discuss, and that is how racism can spoil a democracy. Um, so I'll pause to read a passage. This is about the march itself. 
And as background, before I read this, I'll just say that Alice Paul reached out to African American women to join the march. Um, the march itself, of course, was a very radical act, but inviting black women to participate um, at a time of uh, racial tension running quite high in America um, was uh, pretty astounding. Um, and when word got out that she had invited black women to, to participate, many women said that they didn't want that to happen and they asked black women not to come. And so Alice Paul, you know, again, she was quite young. And when this day finally came, um, she sort of took a passive aggressive approach and just let it be what it would be. And so black women turned up and here's what happened. The college section featured 1000 females in their academic robes, Paul among them too humble to march up front with the National Americans leadership. They were holding banners from Swarthmore, Bryn Mawr, Vassar, Wellesley, Smith, Goucher, George Washington, Radcliffe, Michigan, and Cornell. Howard, a historically black college, was also represented with a contingent of nearly 40 women of color. Most of them were members of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority, founded the previous month for the purpose of joining the march. Women of color also mixed within the labor section, portraying massive wage inequality. The toll of women helps to make the nation rich, one banner emphasized. One float carried a dirty, disheveled woman and her children bending over sewing machines. Paul deliberately arranged the 39 non-suffrage states behind this group in alphabetical order, beginning with Alabama and ending with Wisconsin. In the middle of this lineup was the Illinois contingent, a group of 65 that included Ida B. Wells, a prominent African-American journalist who years before had sued the railroad successfully for not letting her sit in the women's car. She had also helped found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1909. While the march was a shocking and radical act, the likes of which had never occurred in America, racially integrated the, integrating the procession was even more so, and it almost did not happen. Earlier in the day, when the Illinois women lined up for a practice drill, their leader, Grace Wilbur Trout, saw Wells and questioned whether she should be there. Her racist comment shocked the group, sending a buzz through the crowd. Some were so embarrassed they were speechless. Trout explained herself by saying, quote, many of the Eastern and Southern women have greatly resented the fact that there are to be colored women in the delegations. Some have even gone so far as to say they will not march if the Negro women are well allowed to take part. End quote. She blamed the decision on the leader of the national as well as on Alice Paul. Trout looked around for approval and found some, but another suffragist, Virginia Brooks, came to the defense of Wells. We have come here to march for equal rights, Brooks said, adding that, quote, if the women of other states lack moral courage, we should show that we are not afraid of public opinion. Wells was deeply hurt by Trout's remarks and let slip two large tears, which she wiped from beneath her veil. Quote, if the Illinois women do not take a stand now in this great democratic parade, then the colored women are lost, Wells said before storming off. At some point after the procession began, Wells jumped back into the Illinois delegation to march in her rightful place, while black women also marched with the Delaware, New York, West Virginia, and Michigan sections. There was one group, however, that was segregated in the back. In the back. When word spread that Mary Church Terrell, a prominent African-American, would lead a strong showing of the National Association of Colored Women, and that Southerners threatened a boycott, the men's section offered to march between these black and white groups. So um, I think it's important just to consider that even uh, given protest movements that are happening uh, today, a common response is often that this is not the right way to protest. Uh, you know, people will say it's disrespectful or unpatriotic. And that is certainly what they told Alice Paul as well. Now, to clarify, she didn't call the march to the White House to protest. She didn't even call it a march. She called it a procession, and it was meant to be a thought-provoking display of all the ways that women make contributions to society. There were no provocative signs aside from those asking for voting rights for women. But guess what? It did not matter what form their protest took. The Wilson administration and its supporters were really outraged, not about what the suffragists were doing, but about what they were demanding, which is voting rights. I'm gonna read one other quick section here about um, an array of creative nonviolent protests that um, Alice Paul's 
uh, team of suffragists undertook over uh, the first four years of Woodrow Wilson's um, term as president and into the second. Um, it's also worth noting that Woodrow Wilson considered himself a progressive Democrat, um, but he was progressive really on sort of financial and uh, and um, financial reforms and uh, government reforms. He was very much a social conservative. So he was anti-suffrage. Um, one of the uh, things that he did when he took office was to try to make government more transparent, which meant that you could literally knock on the door of the White House and say, I want to meet with the president. And people did that, including the suffragists. And they had done this many, many times. So the passage I'm going to read you is um, the suffragists returning from one of those meetings in the White House with Woodrow Wilson. The women slowly made their exit from the East Room of the White House and returned to their new headquarters. After four years of toil and hardship in the damp basement on F Street, the National Women's Party, which was the political organization that Alice Paul created, had finally moved to a place of prominence. Cameron House stood at 21 Madison Place on the edge of Lafayette Park in front of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The building, a wide three-story brick townhouse, had several benefits. First, it was visible and just 200 steps away from the White House. The Wilsons could see the suffrage flag fluttering from its perch on the third floor balcony. Second, there was ample space to work and entertain guests, from tourists and strangers walking in off the street to catch a glimpse of the women, to those attending ever-expanding fundraisers. There were also bedrooms to accommodate Paul and others, eliminating their daily commute. Paul was now using the Susan B. Anthony desk, an old Victorian cylinder roll top, that Anthony's secretary had donated to the National Woman's Party. When the indignant suffragists walked through Cameron House's front door, they entered into a great hall with a large staircase and a fireplace that burned eternal. Paul was there waiting for them, ready to stoke their anger as they dropped into comfortable chairs in front of the flames and asked the question again, how long must we wait? With the women assembled in front of the fire, Paul pitched a carefully orchestrated idea, which she asked Harriet Stanton Blatch to present. Harriet Stanton Blatch, by the way, was the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and her mother, um, Cady Stanton, was of the old line suffragist group who only believed in state level voting rights. So mother and daughter had a split with Harriet joining Alice Paul and the radicals. We have got to take a new departure, Blatch told them. We have got to bring to the president day by day, week in, week out, the idea that great numbers of women want to be free, will be free, and want to know what he's going to do about it. We need to have a silent vigil in front of the White House until his inauguration in March. Let us stand beside the gateway where he must pass in and out so that he can never fail to realize that there is a tremendous earnestness and insistence in back of this measure. You can advance to the next slide here. So far, with Paul as their leader, the women had marched four years earlier in 1913 in one of the largest and most outrageous protests America had ever seen. They had assembled an 80-car brigade to deliver signatures from all over the nation. They had testified, editorialized, and reorganized. They had formed their own political party. They held May Day parades in nearly every state in the Union. They raised funds and actively worked to defeat Democrats, and of course, Democrats were the party in power. And up until this point, suffragists had never become political. They had never held any party accountable for uh, voting rights. But Alice Paul took a new departure with this, too, and said, I don't care who's in the White House, Republican or Democrat, whoever it is, we're going to hold them accountable. And so it was the Democrats. They had a booth at a global exposition, collected a miles long scroll of signatures and drove it cross country from San Francisco. And that's what you see here in the image on the right. These three, these three women who made that uh, remarkable trip at a time before interstate highways existed and gas stations weren't even a thing then. They dropped leaflets from the sky. Uh, as you can see here, uh, that's Lucy Burns in a biplane over Seattle. There was a long suffrage flag uh, fluttering from the tail of this as, as she dropped those leaflets. Uh, it's one of my favorite suffrage images from that time. And they had sacrificed one of their own, and that would have been Inez Milholland, the woman from the White Horse who collapsed on a Western campaign tour and died. 
So on this day, in front of the crackling fire at their new headquarters with the White House at their backs, they may have been exhausted, but they were neither depleted of ideas nor the passion to continue the struggle. They listened as Blatch offered a new form of protest. In America, pickets had become a common union tactic, typically ending in violence, but suffragists had been employing the practice as well. Blatch had used pickets in her Votes for Women campaign with the New York legislature in 1912. So when she delivered her final plea to the women of Cameron House, they stirred. Will you not, she asked, be a silent sentinel of liberty and self-government. On the next slide, you'll see, as it turns out, um, Washingtonians thought that women standing silently holding signs in front of the White House was even more outrageous, and it triggered a series of unwarranted arrests with sentences of up to six months. On the next slide, you can see an artist's depiction on the left of uh, force feeding um, that happened to these women once they were in prison. They went on hunger strikes. Um, on the right, you see Lucy Burns here, the same woman from the back of that biplane. Lucy Burns was Alice Paul's number two. Um, Lucy was uh, the daughter of Irish immigrants. She came from Brooklyn, um, but she and Alice Paul met each other in jail uh, in London. Uh, Lucy had been studying abroad as well and also got tangled up with the Pankhurst. They became the dynamic duo of the movement. On the next slide, um, you'll see uh, that Alice Paul was committed to a psychiatric ward. In the image on the left, in the top right corner of that, you can see a window that's boarded up. That was Alice Paul's window in the psych ward. Uh, the doctor who committed her said that she was clearly obsessed with Woodrow Wilson and uh, needed to be um, locked up there. But doing that really just generated more sympathy for her, um, as you can see from uh, some of the signs on the right. So um, next, on the next slide, I'd like to talk about the similarities between Woodrow Wilson and our current rise in white nationalism. One of the first things that Woodrow Wilson did after he was elected president in 1913 was to segregate the civil service. And he was also the first president elected from the South since Reconstruction. So that combination um, really empowered white supremacists and triggered racial violence, including lynchings again. And all of this gave the Ku Klux Klan the boost that it needed. In fact, the first film ever screened in the White House occurred during Wilson's term, and it was a film called Birth of a Nation, which is about the Klan, and it was created by a friend of Woodrow Wilson's. So racism, then combined with nationalism for another combustible mix. When the First World War erupted, Wilson clamped down on the First Amendment, attacking not just the press, but individuals who were criticizing him. And on the streets, there was a mob mentality. If any seemingly able-bodied man or those with a foreign accent were seen uh, or heard in public, they would be assumed to be a spy or else why else were they not fighting on the battlefields of Europe? Vigilantes would beat them up and drag them to the police and the government supported this process, uh, due process be damned. Going after those he believed to be seditious extended to Alice Paul and the rest of the silent sentinels. And also uh, Russia played a role in all of this too, which you can see on the next slide. So what happened here was there was a, a Russian delegation arriving to meet with Wilson to talk about what was happening with the war. Russian women, it should be said, already had the vote, even though uh, women in America did not. And so the suffragists, you see Lucy Burns, um, she's the woman in the middle um, holding the Russia banner. Um, uh, people were outraged that these envoys were met with a protest sign and people attacked these women and tore the sign up and they would just come back with yet another sign all over again. But what was happening here was that women were beginning to point out the utter hypocrisy that America was fighting for democracy abroad and did not have it at home. On the next slide, you'll see that, you know, past is indeed prologue. 
And we have so much to learn from the suffrage movement. For example, if we're fighting for democratic ideals, we need to include everyone or else we're not really fighting for democracy, are we? We're only fighting for some people. Change is hard and it can take a really long time. The first women's rights convention at Seneca Falls was in 1848. So it took another 72 years before women could vote. And even then, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, not all women. Black women and black men face disenfranchisement through poll taxes and literacy tests. The federal government did not recognize Native Americans as citizens until 1924, so they could not vote. Those of Asian descent could not become citizens and vote until 1952. And the Voting Rights Act meant to address all of the barriers to voting passed in 1965. And yet, voter suppression continues. There's always more work to do to make our union more perfect. On the next slide, you'll see that Alice Paul knew this. In fact, her work did not end when the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. Three years later, she wrote the Equal Rights Amendment, which passed Congress in 1972, but was never fully ratified by the necessary 38. However, in the last three years, Illinois in 2017, Nevada in 2018, and Virginia in 2020 all ratified the ERA, becoming the 36th, 37th, and 38th states, respectively, to do so. Uh, forward to the next slide, please. You can see here, this is Jennifer Carroll Foy, who's uh, uh, Virginia House of Delegates um, running for governor of Virginia. Um, she was the leader on the ERA, ERA in that state. And in fact, many women of color are leading the charge around the ERA um, right now. On the next slide, you'll see um, this is the current map of the ERA yes states, which looks quite similar to the map I showed you earlier with the states that refuse to grant voting rights to women. So, um, you know, I think when the, the main point here is that uh, women pushing for the ERA know that change is slow and the work is never ending. And I hope that they take their inspiration from something Alice Paul once said, which is carry the banner always. And you can just pr progress to the next slide, which is my last slide to say thank you. And I'm happy to take comments or questions. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina, for that um, that presentation. And I'm going to go ahead and check our chat to see if we have questions entered here. Let's see. While I'm while I'm waiting to load the the chat window, I do have a question. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that you discovered Alice Paul and uh, the ERA amendment on social media, on Twitter with the hashtag. Um, today, obviously, we see that social media has been demonized and um, there's a lot of backlash and it's even accused of destroying our, our democracy, um, especially when we look back at the 2016 presidential election and when this um, a flurry of misinformation was propagated online. What, so what would you say about social media and its role in our democracy today? Let me go ahead and unmute you. There you go. So it's, it's a great question. Um, I think many of us have mixed feelings about social media and, um, you know, there are some who say it's a platform and, and, you know, the message is what it is. Um, I do think that um, the challenge with social media is that it doesn't have any guardrails, right? As with uh, traditional media outlets, they could decide not to pu publish something that they knew to be false. Um, I think on the one hand, you know, social media gets the credit for facilitating big sweeping democratic movements like the Arab Spring, for example, unfolding because of Twitter. Um, but as you said, it, the opposite can happen. It can have a crushing effect on democracy as well. 
Um, I think there's more work that social media companies need to do to rein in misinformation, the use of bots. Um, and I think, you know, the main thing is for us all as consumers of information increasingly on social media is that we are aware of what it is that we are being fed and checking our sources and facts. Um, you know, I mean, I, I feel like I live in that space every day as a writer of history and a user of primary source materials. It's tedious, but, um, you know, I, I think we all have to be really careful and vigilant about that. I also think, you know, Alice Paul was able to organize that march in 1913, you know, using snail mail. <laughs> um, you know, very few people even had telephones, uh, let alone email and social media. I don't know how she pulled that off in a couple of months um, to such a degree, but it's really quite a feat if you think about it. Right. And Alice Paul is often. Um... She's referred to as like a, a public relations, you know, genius. How do you think she would have utilized social media today? Oh, I think she would have been excellent at it. Um, she, they were issuing press releases every day. They would have daily press conferences, sort of inviting the media into their uh, National Women's Party headquarters. Um, so she knew how to use the media quite well. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, the, the best parallel is the fact that she created her own newspaper called The Suffragist. And she used it um, to good effect because not only did she get donations or subscriptions as a primary means to fund her movement, but it was a house organ. You know, you can call it propaganda or you can call it the facts of what they were doing every day, but it was her way of getting her message out unfiltered, which is very much how many or movement leaders today use social media. Right, okay, so I see a couple of questions in our chat here. Um, one question is, or asks, are you comparing President Wilson to Trump with um, your comments about nationalism? Um, I think white nationalism has existed in our country long before Donald Trump was in office, and I think that it, you know, it will exist when he leaves office. And to think about what the sources of that are, how to dismantle it, um, you know, um, why it continues to thrive. I think there are moments in our country's history where um, that sort of primary source of, of white supremacy gets fed. And it's really important to think about, like, and it's different in, in every case, like, what are the issues right now that are feeding into the rise of white nationalism? Um, you know, I feel like that could be a whole separate conversation and people can have lots of different what that is. Um, but, um, you know, I think we, we definitely are seeing this happen right now and we all need to consider what those factors are contributing to that. Right. Okay. And another question. Do you think Alice Paul and the WNP could have, um, I guess, won the 19th Amendment without other women suffragists, such as Carrie Chapman Catt and Minnie Fisher Cunningham in Texas, and I guess other uh, supporters of suffrage. Do you think Alice Paul basically could have carried the movement through the final stretch on her own with her tactics? I love this question. Um, and I have debated it many times. On the one hand, the only reason why there was a federal amendment is because Alice Paul insisted upon it and made it happen. On the other hand, it's worth thinking about the grassroots organizing that the other suffragists were doing at the state level that ultimately helped move the ratification through. And so I do think that while it was a movement divided and these two groups of women really hated each other and competed for resources and mind share um, among the public about what the right strategy was, ultimately they both benefited from each other as did women all across America. But I think at that time, in that moment, neither group could really see that. We can see it now a century later. Uh, to the point about other suffragists, though, I will also, I just want to acknowledge that every single state in this country had suffragists who were working hard to push this idea forward, whether it was through state level 
voting rights or the federal amendment. And there are there were thousands, if not millions of them working to make this happen. And, you know, I I hope that women in every state are able to find like local examples or family members or distant relatives and to share their stories because, um, you know, for me, it's as important as recognizing people who fought in the Civil War or the Second World War. Um, you know, these these women were they were they were in it and we won. And so it's important to remember them, too. Yeah, that's a great answer to a great question. And uh, we have another great question here in the chat. It says, um, so it's a comment and then a question. Um, Edward Carmack, extremely racist Tennessee newspaper editor who battled with Ida B. Wells, recently had his statue torn down in Nashville. Some have suggested replacing it with a statue of Wells. Um, the comment says, I see this as fitting. So what what is your, um, or the question is, did Paul have any more contact with Wells after 1913, uh, the parade in 1913? If so, could you talk about that and also discuss more about Paul's relationship with Mary Church Terrell? So there are a few questions in there. Did you, let me go ahead and unmute you. Okay, go ahead. First of all, Ida B. Wells was one of, is one of the great unsung heroines of uh, the suffrage movement and you know a brilliant journalist and activist on so many levels so she deserves so much more attention than she has received and i think she's beginning to uh get that attention finally um as it relates to um alice paul and her relationship with ida b wells uh you know after the parade you know alice paul in continued to invite Ida B. Wells and even Mary Church Terrell to be among the silent sentinels. Mary Church Terrell did pick it. Um, and it's remarkable to think that, um, you know, in a racially divided city like Washington, D.C., you know, at the heart of the federal government, which had been segregated uh, by the president himself, that a black woman would stand in front of the White House basically taunting that president about suffrage is mind blowing, the courage that that took. Um, and, you know, it also took courage for Alice Paul, despite all the rebukes she got from other white women, not to be including black women, that she continued to reach out. I will say that, um, and that, and that black women, black women stepped up and continued to participate. And they participated not just, you know, where Alice Paul asked them to, but they were all doing hard work in their own communities through church groups and clubs and, and so forth. So there were black just in every city and town across America doing the work as well. I will say where, you know, the, 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 the worst aspect of Alice Paul's um, leadership on this subject was the fact that she did not believe that she could tackle race. She only believed she could handle one big issue and that was gender. And I do not think that she appreciated that for black women, gender and race were always combined and that was an inescapable truth. Um, so I think, you know, she certainly comes under criticism for that and for, you know, black women who raised the alarm saying, well, you're gonna pass this 19th amendment and that's great, but we kind of can see the future. We know what's gonna happen. States are gonna shut us down. And Alice Paul was basically like, I don't know how to help you in that situation. And I'm gonna stay focused on gender. And, and then she pivoted to the Equal Rights Amendment after the 19th Amendment. And so, you know, it's hard to get into Alice Paul's mind a century later. Um, you know, I think you can be both anti-racist and racist all at the same time, as incongruent as that sounds. And a federal amendment was the most anti-racist thing that she could do because she knew that it was racist Southern states that were the firewall against women getting the vote. And by imposing it on them through a federal amendment would help black women everywhere. Um, you know, and it's, it's uh, you know, you can call it politically expedient, you can call it racist, you can call it imperfection. Um, it's just the facts as the history happened at that time. And I think that, what I'm most interested in is, is learning the lessons from that moment.
we do things that are politically expedient, for example, um, you know, are we always making the right decision? Or are we, you know, overimposing purity tests on leaders who are trying to get any progress enshrined in law, right? I mean, these are hard questions and um, it's, it's totally reasonable for opinions about them. Great, okay, our next question. If you had lived as a young woman in 1917, where would, have you, where would you have been on this issue? Would you have marched and picketed? I feel like I know the answer to that, but uh, let me go ahead and unmute you, go ahead. Yes, I absolutely would have um, marched or and picketed and probably been organizing my community. Um, you know, it's for me, democracy, voting is at the heart of democracy. And I think that we should all be doing everything we can to make sure as many people as possible who are eligible to vote have no barriers to prevent them from doing so. So I, I believe that in my in my soul today, and um, you know I, I think it's essential. I would have been out there in my comfortable shoes, <laughs> and I would have packed my lunch and stayed out there all night and into the next day if I had to. Right. That's that's what I imagine. But um, I think so. So many many of us look back and, and think, you know we would have been on a certain side of the history or an issue at that time. But I mean, I feel like I could say, I know I would have been organizing and picketing, but it's it's hard to say. I, um, I know that's a question a lot of people ask themselves. Sure, well, I would even say, what are you all doing right now? Right? I mean, there's always more work to be done. And I think that we can all look inside and say, you know, do I have five minutes to make phone calls or to help with get out the vote efforts in my community? Am I teaching my kids how to get a voting plan together? Right, that's a great point. Um, which leads to the question um, or yeah, about education. Now, when we, Alice Paul, as a Quaker woman, they believed in educating women in their communities, and she was highly educated. Uh, do you think in the South that education or lack thereof was an issue as far as, um, you know, rallying people for, for suffrage? Um, I don't think it was uh, just education or the lack of access to it at that time. You know, there are so many issues here, right? There's um, sort of the, the remnants of reconstruction, um, which includes lack of access to education. You have, uh, you know, bad infrastructure, you know, rural economies, um, people just being, you know, physically distant and, and um, disconnected from each other. Uh, and movements. Um, I think that we can't not talk about patriarchy and the fact that systems in the South were run by men, um, white men, and that um, religion played another really big role in all of this. Um, you know, uh, Wilson came from a conservative uh, Christian family and Part of that belief structure was that, you know, women belonged at home. And so, you know, I think that there are still plenty of people today who share that belief and, um, you know, the extent to which geography and religion combine to create kind of cultural block, a way of thinking, um, you know, that certainly happened at that time. Right. Okay, we have another question here please comment on the men in government and society who supported the suffragist movement well uh thank goodness for them uh of course men were the ones who were in power in government and it was up to them to vote to give women the same right to vote so for me it's it's a it's an extremely important uh, reminder that every movement needs allies 
And that just because someone appears to be on the other side of the fence, uh, like, you know, men versus women, it doesn't mean that men don't understand or can't empathize with the, with the rights that women are being denied. Um, so, of course, this also means there were men in every state who were supportive. Um, you know, and, and I will also just say the flip side of that is that there were women who didn't support suffrage as well. And, you know, we still see this uh, today where, you know, groups seem to undermine themselves um, or their own best interests. It often, it, what it really means is that, um, you know, voters often vote based on religion and class and therefore by party and very rarely about, is it ever about gender? And I think it's a real misnomer that there are women's issues when it comes to politics and so forth. You know, women care about the economy and foreign policy and all of that too. Okay, so next question here. Okay, let's see. Well, someone made a comment that the ERA ratification map and the 19th Amendment ratification map look very similar, um, which you pointed out. And another comment we have it states, let's see. Get down here. Oh, someone else commented that you needed the scary Alice Paul to get people to accept, uh, by comparison, the tamer Carrie Chap. Uh, Chapman cat, you needed them to, uh, you needed her, you needed them to balance each other out. So do you have a comment on that? I absolutely agree with that, that it takes the more radical person so that you view the, the other the moderate, right? I mean, because without Alice Paul, Carrie Chapman cat also looked like a crazy lunatic to many Americans, <laughs> but she wasn't. I kind of had just a um, like a comment myself about the fact that Wilson used the issue or the situation with states' rights to avoid the question. Um, and how do you feel like the suffragists really like they? How did they shape their campaign to sort of get around that? Because I mean, I think that's what he was really trying to. I mean, we see that today as well. Do you see parallels between that kind of you know what was happening then and what happens now as well? Sort of national leaders using the state's rights to avoid, you know, having to address a certain question. Absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a very astute observation. You're absolutely right. For Wilson, it was about state's rights um, and I think his own social conservatism, which he knew many southern states also shared. Um, and, you know, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't limit that comment just to southern states. I mean, you know, there were northern states and western states that were very late to come uh, to the table on suffrage as well. Um, so, you know, I think that's why Alice Paul's strategy was so brilliant and necessary, because she knew that regardless, um, you know, there were always going to be this, these states that said no. So how do you impose a federal law uh, to, to force it? Um, and, you know, it's fine if a block of states say we're not participating, we won't ratify, but if you meet the necessary threshold with all the other states, I mean, it's another really fascinating aspect of how our democracy functions, right? It's another approach to figure out what do the majority of states want. And if the majority of states say they want this federal amendment, then that's what it will be, and that's what it was. Um, you know, I think what's fascinating as it relates to voting rights is all of the times we have written a federal amendment to address the lack of voting rights with certain groups, first with black men and with the 15th Amendment right after the Civil War, which expressly excluded women. I mean, right there, had an opportunity right then to just give everyone voting rights, and they didn't. And that caused one of the really awful splits between um, even abolitionists and suffragists. Um, you know, the suffragists like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were very early abolitionists. Um, and when they were excluded from the 15th Amendment, they said, well, I guess we can't, you know, focus our efforts on race anymore. We have to just focus on ourselves um, and, and gender issues. And it's why today people look back and say, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were racist. Um, you know, but it's always sort of, you know, you've got this power structure 
that leaves it to the people at the bottom to fight for scraps amongst each other. And it's wrong. And we see that repeated time and again throughout history. You know, um, they wanted to work together at the bottom and they were is divide and conquer strategy, right? Um, so just another really unfortunate twist in the whole saga, but yeah, states rights, it's still a thing. Yeah. Great. Um, Bronwyn, do you see any other chat questions? Let's see. Yes, I do. I have a couple of other questions here. Um, please discuss Paul's decision not to go to Nashville, 1920. Uh, were there other factors besides funding? It's a good question. Uh, I don't believe there were other factors. She had her army on the ground um, and she was really orchestrating things at the national level. I mean, they were scraping the bottom of the barrel when it came to budget. And I will just say that if you don't know, at the end of her life, Alice Paul died penniless in a nursing home in New Jersey, so poor that they had to pass the hat to get her clothes. So, um, you know, she always was relying on donations um, from people just to keep her organization afloat. She was not, you know, inherently rich. There were some very wealthy women who wrote large checks to keep them going, including Alva Belmont. But, um, you know, uh, again, it's a, it's a, she was fighting for dollars with the other suffrage organization at a time when, you know, the country was in a recession and there was a world war happening. So, um, you know, definitely tough times. The other thing I will say is that Alice Paul as a person was, it, she was never in it for the personal glory. Um, you know, I think that for, for most of us with an ego, you would think she would wanna be there to see her hard work come to a glorious conclusion. She didn't care. Um, and uh, she literally, uh, she, you see her repeat that behavior at many critical junctures, even when Congress was voting on um, this amendment. She just would be like, okay, it looks like this is gonna pass or looks like it's not. I gotta get back to my desk and write fundraising letters, and move on to the next thing. So she was kind of a robot like that. She was a machine. <laughs> So uh, on Tuesday evening, I, I mentioned to you that I um, I, I virtually streamed a, a play about Alice Paul and her younger self and then her older self. And the Alice Paul Institute on, online, they have available the, um, the oral history, the interview with Alice Paul about, um, you know, her career as a suffragist. It was something she dedicated her entire life to, um, but then the ERA, and um, of course, she was reluctant to discuss it uh, is one of the points they make. And looking back now, I think, you know, if they they were not able to get her recorded and, and you know, preserve that history, where where would we be now? I'm assuming you listened to that to those tapes, that recording for uh, research for your book. Yeah, I absolutely listened to that oral history, which is great. I mean, always helpful to absorb the character of a person by listening to their actual voice. Um, but she doesn't reveal a whole, a whole lot in that. And, you know, and I think that there, from a primary source material perspective, there's not a lot of um, personal letters that she saved. Of course, other people saved correspondence that she sent to them. But, you know, for, for Alice Paul, it wasn't personal. She believed that all women deserve to be equal or that all pe people deserve to be equal. And so I think it's, you know, you have to really believe that in order to dedicate your whole life to it and not expect to be made famous. You never want to be famous. Right. Okay. We do have another question here or comment and question. Um, I thought your information about Wilson's emotional and physical health during this time was interesting. Could you talk a little about this in connection with uh, his change and final support for the amendment. I thought a lot about that. And I think part of this was that Wilson, so for those who don't know, Wilson uh, suffered a stroke 
uh, that made him incapacitated. But even in the weeks and months leading up to that stroke, he was growing physically weaker. Um, the war had really um, wrung him out. And of course, there was the Spanish flu pandemic happening. And, um, you know, and he, Wilson had been suffering from health issues for, for neurological health issues for a number of years. And so I think that Wilson was just generally exhausted after going through all of that. And he was coming to the end of his second term and he, um, you know, really wanted people to pay attention to his goal, which was to create the League of Nations and to bring peace to the world. But at home, everything was frayed and fraught. And so he also read the tea leaves and I think really understood that public sentiment had changed quite a bit on suffrage and people were supporting it. And so he just kind of threw up his arms and said, it's doing no one any good to have me stand in the way of this federal amendment at this point. I'm coming up as a lame duck president. I'm not running again. And I could actually do my party damage in the next election, um, you know, if I don't uh, push this forward. So I don't think that he came to any like moral epiphany. I think he was unwell, exhausted and being strategic politically when he said, OK, let's push the, the amendment forward towards the end of the second term. Comment about Wilson, he's, he's quite regressive. I mean, would you say he was pretty regressive? Uh, I mean, he was regressive. And it's just interesting to me how, you know, we kind of go back and forth in this country between between regressive leaders and progressive leaders. And it's just, it's not really a question, it's just an observation, but it's uh, kind of interesting. He was definitely on the regressive side. Absolutely was. And, uh, you know, if you think about where, in he, he ascended as president at a time that progressivism or the progressive movement was sweeping across America. It's also interesting to think about the other things that were happening. The NAACP was founded during this time, the AFL-CIO, right? So race, labor, and the, the, this first wave, um, the second wave of this women's movement, of course. So um, there was a lot happening in the world. And yeah, you kind of have to think, you know, what were people afraid of all of that change happening so quickly? And was that why Wilson won? I think it also perhaps wisely helped him to frame himself as a progressive, even though he was quite progressive socially. Um, so it's it's a definitely an, in, an, an instance where uh, sort of the adjectives that we use and how we describe ourselves or brand ourselves, you know, really matters. Perfect. Yes, well, we are right at our 2 p.m. cutoff point. Um, Tina, I want to thank you so much for joining us this week um, and for giving this virtual author talk and presentation. I want to give everyone a moment. If you have any last comments um, for, for Tina, go ahead and type them in the chat, not the Q&A. And I just, I just wanted to, to ask one last question that has to do with your research for the book. So the timeline between when you found out about Alice Paul and when you published this book was that what a two year period? Okay, let me go ahead and unmute you. So, so as, soon as, as soon as you found out information with that hashtag, you just dived into this project. It was fast. That's right. Yeah, and and about two and a half years later, my book came out, and then it. So that was a year ago in March, and this past March, it came out in paperback. So, yeah, fantastic. Um, Okay, we have people commenting. This was a fantastic presentation. I wanna thank you again for um, setting aside this time in your day to join us and to uh, teach us all a little bit more about Alice Paul and um, the Equal Rights Amendment and the suffrage movement of the progressive era. And I'd like to encourage everyone to purchase a paperback copy or a hardback copy of Tina's book. Um, Tina, do you have yours to show? I think I have, yes. We have ours to show, and you can also uh, go into the library catalog and uh, check out the audiobook while you're waiting for your physical copy to come in. And I want to ask Bronwyn if you have any closing remarks before we let Tina go. No, just uh, thank you so much for joining us. That was so interesting and uh, such a great discussion. I do just have, I have to share this one last comment that I got in uh, via email. It's just regarding that comment I made on progressives. Um, 
Professor O'Brien says many of the progressives were racists, not just Wilson. They used progressive policies to reinforce segregation. So he just made that comment there. So just wanted to share that. But thank you so much. It was such a great discussion. We really appreciate you joining us today. And I'm just going to remind everyone the link to this discussion will eventually be on that LibGuide page. Again, thank you all for joining us, Tina. Thank you. And um, have have fun celebrating Women's Equality Day next week. And we'll be following you. Uh, we'll be following you on Twitter and social media. Perfect. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you.